long, but I'm going to officially <laughs> welcome everyone to a tasting I personally have been looking forward to for a while. Um, I'm Madeline Pond of Plum Market with a friend from, she's sitting in the Russian River Valley, right, Teresa? I sure am. Uh, I have the best view right there. Do you? Uh, mm -hmm. So I'm going to, I may call you Teresa once in a while because a lot of sure. your members call you Teresa. They and do. We're going to spend um, about an hour with each other. So just a couple of pieces of, um, you know, uh, essential and probably obvious housekeeping, but I like to overstate the obvious. Um, we have, if you have all three of the wines, they're the Russian River Valley Chardonnay 17, the 17 Russian River Pinot, and the 16 um, Halberd Pinot, which I don't believe was available at the Plum Market store in Chicago, and I apologize for that. So you may have uh, one, two, or all three. Um, we've talked about the order, though there, there are no wine police, correct? <laughs> True. <laughs> Um, but, you know, if we want to do it together, we're going to taste the Chardonnay and then the two Pinots uh, together, correct? We're going to do sure, that sounds fine. And um, we did uh, opt to do this, and you can blame me for this, um, do it webinar style instead of chat room because we were, you know, fluttering around 100 people. However, uh, you can be enthusiastic in the chat room and in the Q&A, and we will uh, keep an eye on it. Um, both of us tend to speak from the heart and keep this cozy, but um, I will ask selfish questions because, you know, what I read and um, what someone who lives it knows are two completely different things. Right. And um, we're going to try to keep it to about an hour. Um, you know, there might be some questions at the end, and I think both of us are pretty relaxed about it. What time is it out there right now? 3.35? It is 3.35. Right, exactly. It is 6.35 in uh, Michigan and 5.35 in Chicago. So, welcome everyone. I'm Madeline Trafon. I officially uh, am the sommelier for Plum Market and uh, unofficially have been a sommelier. I can't even say som, that's how I date back, right? <laughs> I like the word sommelier. I've been serving people wine, uh, mostly in restaurants, but now on events that have gone from live to virtual almost overnight, right? Um, since I was 21 years old, and that was a little while ago. So um, all y'all, as they would say in the South, are my very best friends. You know, you are always in my subconscious. And by that, I mean, and I realized this recently, I don't think I pick up a glass of wine, put my nose in the glass, think about it, write about it, talk about it without you in my subconscious. Like, because I think that we intentionally have to use language that the people who are going to buy and drink the wine understand and sometimes we forget to do that right Teresa so absolutely um I met Teresa uh, uh several years ago at the winery when she first started that was 2012 correct officially yeah was it my first year or was it the next I don't recall but I don't it was remember long time but it, it was the Sonoma Summit which my friend Evan Goldstein um uh, was hosting for yeah. a bunch of uh, sommelier types and quite a few master sommeliers. And we had a dinner at the cellar and you yeah. came to us. And I, I was really taken with your presence, you know, and, and frankly, uh, the risk of flattering you, but you just let it keep, keep you warm because I'm sure you deal with challenges and adversity too. <laughs> the fact that you took this um, established winery and really made it your own. And I'm very glad that you make yourself accessible to us. So thank you. Teresa, Teresa is going to tell us about uh, herself a little bit before we start talking about the Russian River. But this tasting is not only a celebration of Gary Farrell and the person whose hands craft uh, uh, the beautiful fruit that comes from the Russian River, but it is uh, about a growing region that we have all heard, we've seen on wine labels, but frankly, the diversity in the Russian River is a little bit of a surprise to me. And I guess I should know better, but I don't walk it like you do daily, you know? Right. And um, so I am uh, very much looking forward to um, hearing about the different pockets that produce different wines in this famous growing region. So welcome to Michigan, 
Illinois and everywhere else, Teresa. <laughs> Thank you. It's so awesome to have so many people. Um, if Nancy, you're listening, maybe if you remember the year that we had the Sonoma Summit at the winery, you can type it in the chat because Madeline and I, Madeline and I, would love to remember when that was. But it was definitely uh, seven to eight years ago because I started eight years ago. I'm about to do my ninth harvest at Gary Farrell, which is crazy. So and this was you joined. I did the math. Thirty years after Gary Farrell made his first wine in whatever it was in the early uh, in the early eighties. Nineteen eighty-two. Yeah. So that's a perfect tee off into the tip off into the history, a little brief history of Gary Farrell. So shall I go ahead? Is that are yeah, you, go are for you it. you've done your intro? Yep. So yeah, so Gary Farrell Winery has been around for a very long time. Um, a lot longer than I've been in the wine industry. So um, coming to the winery as a winemaker was definitely a daunting task for me. Um, it was scary. It was big, big shoes to fill. But I had spent uh, 10 years as the winemaker for Joseph Phelps Freestone Vineyards prior to my start here at Gary Farrell. And Freestone is out on the way far west Sonoma coast, really close to the ocean near Bodega Bay. If any of you have been out here, very chilly. Um, it's chilly like, you know, like being in San Francisco. And so that's a really cool climate for Pinot and Chardonnay. And that's really uh, where I spent 10 years learning how to make Pinot Noir and Chardonnay from a cool climate. So um, prior to that, I was at UC Davis. I, I actually got to UC Davis, not to study wine, not to study viticulture and enology, but I, I started there to get my doctorate in chemistry. And uh, I thought I wanted to be a professor at a university. But while I was there, I was a teaching assistant, as are many graduate students, because you have to make a dime, right? So um, there were 12 of us, 12 graduate, uh, uh, graduate student teaching assistants. And so we got together to grade exams. We were teaching general chemistry. We were teaching the labs, each of us. And so we got together, all 12 of us, to grade 400 exams. And um, we each started talking excitedly about our research projects. I excitedly spoke about my peptide synthesis. I was building a peptide library and doing cancer therapeutics research. Really cool stuff, right? But I was never going to see the results of my research in my lifetime. Um, and then the enology students, the viticulture enology students, started talking about their research. And they brought bottles of wine and little tasting glasses to the grading sessions. And I was just mind blown. And they started talking about their research. And I realized we're doing the same chemistry. They were, we were using the same types of instruments to do uh, analysis for our, our graduate research projects. Their product was wine. My product was peptides. Had you and fallen so, in love with wine at that point? I had already been bitten by the wine bug. I had been to Bordeaux, Burgundy, and the Rhone Valley the previous uh, spring. And so I, was already, I had already fallen in love with Burgundy, yes. Did I know that I could make a career out of it? No, absolutely not. So um, when I... I started talking to them, I realized I can take all the coursework that I had already done in chemistry and transfer it to the viticulture and enology program. And so that's exactly what I did. Within a few days, I transferred into the wine program and I never looked back. Oh, so, wait, this was like a little aha moment, correct? Yeah, absolutely. It was wine. literally, literally aha. My chemistry can transfer. I can drink wine. It's more of a, an instant gratification, which is more my style. Um, and again, a reminder that I would never have seen the results of my project in my lifetime. It was cancer you, therapy. Do you keep research. in touch with any of those, uh, any of those guys? The ones from chemistry or enology? Yeah. Uh, the ones uh, that you were um, grading uh, papers with from chemistry? Uh, I haven't seen them in a few years, no, but definitely, you know, we're all busy. You know, one of them is now yeah. a CEO or CFO and... No, CEO, and then another one is a winemaker down the road, and you know, et cetera, et cetera. Jeff Magahas and I went to school together, a uh, winemaker from William Sellium. So we're all spread out in the industry and we're all busy, so we're in touch, but not on a regular basis. So anyway, it was a great way, it was a great intro to the wine industry, and you know, Phelps hired me really soon after graduate school, and prior to that, I had done a hard at Saintsbury. So Saintsbury is Pinot and Chardonnay as well. So it was it was meant to be. When Phelps hired me out of grad school, um, their their harvest enologist, excuse me, their full-time enologist had just left to start his own wine brand. Oh, so and you know the universe was in alignment at that moment. It was in alignment because yeah. they were looking for somebody with a chemistry background and they were looking for somebody interested in Pinot Noir and Chardonnay 
to spearhead the Freestone project because they hadn't made wine from there yet. The vineyard had been planted in 2000 and 2001. You so, were involved in the first, the first uh, vintage of Freestone? Yes, I yep. made the first 10 years of, of wine at Freestone. So it was a great. Uh, then I appreciated you before I knew who you were because I, uh, <laughs> you know, I thought that was a big pivot for Phelps too. So it was really yeah. to go from the wines I was familiar, you know, uh, insignia, cabernet, et cetera, and then all of a sudden this lifted, uh, elegant pinot noir and chardonnay. So it was yeah, hands behind it, and here we are. You were where were you getting uh, grapes from? Uh, for, you were you were like here. Uh, Bodega, so very close to Bodega Bay. If you uh, okay, drag like your mouse here. over Bodega Bay, it's yeah. just barely inland from that area right there. So okay. very close to the ocean, very cool climate, um, and really beautiful wines. Low elevation, you know, maybe maximum 500 feet elevation. So drenched in the fog all the time. So really beautiful, bright flavors and really gorgeous acidity. Um, a little bit similar to our Fort Ross Pinot, but not, not completely. And just to remind everybody, because again, remember, I'm the girl who likes to overstate the obvious, and I truly am a map freak, and you guys have the best map. Yes, Our yes, we do. Friends. I agree. You, you really do. Your Russian River map we're working to telescope in is the best, but I like to remind us all we are north of San Francisco, so we talk about, you know, the effect from the bay. Uh, here's, here's Marin County, just to put it in a uh, frame of reference. This is uh, the Russian River Valley. This is the Russian River Valley here. Uh, here's Sonoma Coast. Russian River is here, and uh, Green Valley is within Russian River. And these are the Mayakamas Mountains, right, that are separating mm -hmm. um, Sonoma from Napa. So you have a lot of Pacific influence. Sorry to to just make that uh, sea spot run comment for a moment. This is beautiful. Mm -hmm. It's a great educational tool, and to explain the mountain ranges and everything, I think is is really useful. So, and that's where you are right now, I see. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, yes, actually, if I, uh, thank you for bringing attention to that. Everyone can admire my um, virtual background, which I routinely, um, I routinely uh, uh, screw up, uh, but I was so absurdly pleased to, to get this, because this is the foggy Russian river, correct? It is, indeed. Mm -hmm. and, and from where I am, from where I am at the winery right now, sitting up above the fog layer, usually on a cold, foggy morning, when you look down just below the outdoor terrace, you can see the fog just bathing, you know, underneath there, um, and it looks kind of like a milky river. It's really beautiful. You know, I want to ask, uh, I get to ask the stupid questions because everyone, you know, a lot of people, including my colleagues, don't want to ask them, where in the Russian River is we have another map coming up that you can show us exactly where the winery is located. Mm -hmm. We do. Okay, cool. Then we'll yeah. just talk about uh, the Russian River for a moment and what is its little thumbprint? So the fog, since we're talking about it, and since you have this beautiful image of the river behind you and also in this picture here, yep. um, you can see that it's um, the fog is actually kind of in the trees in this picture. But, you know, the Russian River literally acts like a conveyor belt, pulling the fog through the Russian River Valley and bathing the grapes. So even if it gets warm during the day, like this weekend, it's supposed to be pretty hot. Um, so the grapes establish this really beautiful, they, they build this really beautiful concentration and, and succulent. So they have rich succulent California typicity, but they have this amazing acid backbone to them because of the cool fog, because it bathes the grapes in the morning and at night, and it helps to retain abundant natural acidity, so they have that really food-friendly, crisp acid backbone to them. That's, now, really, that's, the, that's really what makes the Russian River Valley special. So correct me if I'm wrong, too, you have, uh, and th this is so cool because it's counterintuitive. We think of the Russian River as being a relatively warm, sun-drenched growing region, but it's not, it's not monochromatic, and you have acidity preserved in some areas by low nighttime temperatures, not everywhere, right? And then pockets where the fog will just go down into a valley. Um, but, in, you know, the punchline is, is you never have to struggle for acidity levels, correct? Regardless you, of where you are. That's right. We have really great acid retention because of the cool foggy weather. And then, you know, we'll get into the neighborhood, the neighborhoods when I talk about the wines, especially the Pinot Noir. 
um, but some neighborhoods are flatter than others, and so cold air settles at night, and so those regions are even, you know, greater acid retention. So it's a what beautiful area. These, these really cool looking guys. I love that we showed these pictures. So these are two of my favorite men that I work with. Um, on the upper left hand side, you have Kirk Laka. He is the grower, the general manager and vineyard manager at Hallberg, uh, so Emeritus Winery. And he sells us the Hallberg grapes. He farms the grapes. Um, he is the master of all things Hallberg. And he is quite a spark plug of a man. So <laughs> I have to tell you, I listened to the video. Um, you did? I listened to the video and he calls himself a paint salesman. Um, He's, yeah. What does he mean when he says that? And he obviously loves you. And he also says that he does what you tell him to do most of the time, but not most of the time. Yes. Right. Um, so what he means by uh, the paint salesman is that he, he sells me different pieces of his different colors from his vineyard, right? So to speak. Um, and I, I use the colors to create my, my piece, which is the Hallberg Vineyard Pinot Noir. And also it's, it's a piece of the Russian River Selection blend as well, a big piece of the Russian River Selection blend. So that's what he means. By he's a and then Nancy Bailey calls him, uh, oh God, what does she call him? Uh, um, an adorable curmudgeon? Nancy, <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong. Something like that. <laughs> so the first time I met him was when Nancy brought me out to the vineyard and I had just started working at Gary Farrell and so she was taking me out to meet the growers. And so we went to Hallberg and later on after I met him, we had lunch and they, um, they cooked us lamb, fresh lamb. Anyway, long story short, that day that I met him, you can see he's a tall man. He's, you know, big hands, large, you know, stature in general. And he stood up above Nancy, who's just a little, she's a few inches taller than I am. He didn't look at me. He looked at her, stood above her and said, she's not going to tell me how to grow my grapes, is she? <laughs> yeah. So that was my first introduction to him. And then come harvest, um, there's a funny story in 2012. His vineyard was one of the first that we picked that year. And 2012 was a big crop. So um, he, he called me at about five in the morning to confirm, you know, two things. He had good news and he had bad news. So the good news was that he had really beautiful fruit for us. He'd filled all our bins and it was ready to be delivered. But then the bad news was that there was more fruit, almost that much more, like he needed almost double the amount of bins to fill because uh, the fruit was that heavy that year. Great well, what quality. did you do? So I said, it was, you know, four or five o'clock in the morning. So um, I'm groggy, it's a new grower relationship, all of them, I didn't want to upset anybody. Normally I would drop an F-bomb, but my response for God knows what reason was, ah, poop. I don't say that usually, I do now because it's cute and funny. But at the time, I don't know why I said it, asked myself after I hung up the phone. So later on, a few days later, he called me about something else to schedule a different block. And he said, hey, Teresa, mi amiga, I didn't have the heart to tell you, but I had you on speakerphone. So everybody <laughs> heard you. Everybody heard you say, ah, poop. And so it became the expression of the season. Ah, poop, more fruit. So, and they that's thought her. of you with a smile every time they said it. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, and so not to dismiss the importance of the gentleman right in the center, because that oh, is Mr. Yes. Joe Rocchioli, Jr., and um, he's, he's almost 90. I want to say he turned 80 in 2013, which was my second vintage at Gary Farrell. I believe that's about right. So um, he's, he's getting up there, and he still goes to his office every day. He's not working, you know, very many hours, but he still goes in. He's still involved. I, he signs my contract every year. Um, so I love he him. He himself great signs your contract every year. Can it's you not really even a contract. It's just a list of all the grapes that we get each year. We don't have an official grape contract with them. It's, it's mostly a handshake agreement. I mean, this is uh, arguably one of the, if not the most famous, um, iconic uh, vineyard owners in California, period. That's a fair statement, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah, it is. Um, yeah. I mean, you could easily say that it's one of the most iconic because people have actually taken budwood or been given budwood from Rocchioli and planted it in their own vineyards and call it, call it the Rocchioli clump. Wow. Like Swan. Swan is one of the iconic vineyards as well. And the Swan selection is something that was budwood that was taken from the Swan vineyard. That was actually Both. a question that came in. What's the difference between, you know, what is the Hallberg? So there's the Rocchioli clone, and then someone asked the question about Hallberg clone. Is, uh, do people do that with the Hallberg vineyard as well? 
No, uh, because Hallberg is planted to a number of different clones. Um, so the difference being that when Joe Rocchioli first planted the vineyard, first of all, just giving a little snippet of information, um, his father farmed the vineyard previously, right? And the Russian River Valley, Sonoma County, California, wasn't really known for super high-end varietals. And so they were growing mass quantity grapes and shipping them to Central California to go into hardy burgundy and things like that. So grapes from California weren't valuable. They weren't very valuable at the time. So as Joe Jr. started to become involved, he was talking to his father and tried to convince him to, you know, to make varietals. California can make these great varietals. We can make Pinot Noir, you know, <laughs> instead of shipping them off to go into hardy burgundy. And so after his father passed away, um, Joe started pulling out, ripping out vines, French columbard and, you know, things like that and started planting varietals. And he got budwood from, uh, from Wente and he got budwood from another gentleman, um, you know, way back in the day. And he planted these, this budwood with no real knowledge of what clones it was or, you know, what heirloom selection it was. So um, it just became now, it could be known as Rocchioli, right? You could, we could just call it Rocchioli clone if it were actually identified as a clone, but it's just, um, it's very likely it's original sources from Pomard. I see. Well, yeah. you know, I mean, the man was truly visionary. I just got chills when you were talking about it because- It's a great story. Angels moving their heads to make them do things, you know? Yeah, how did, he just had a feeling. You know, he had a feeling that California could be as, as great as, as France. Now, in terms before of we, we jump into this uh, map, uh, I want to make sure that those of you who have the Chardonnay are playing with it, sipping on it, and uh, Teresa and I will talk about it. But, you know, we may as well, if you don't mind, can we describe it right now? Because you talked about France, and I want to remind us all uh, yeah. that when we say white burgundy, we're talking Chardonnay. And this may sound... Um, Simple, but I'll never forget, uh, you know, in the past, I would be hanging out with collectors who had enough, you know, Le Marachet. I mean, I've tasted Le Marachet once in my life. And when I talked about Chardonnay and White Burgundy, be it Pouligny or a single vineyard, some of them were shocked to, to hear that that was the grape variety was Chardonnay. So this is, um, this is the grape we're talking about with, uh, with roots in Burgundy. And um, I've been playing with this to the point where I only have about an ounce left of it for the last hour and I've been I started too cold and now it's probably too warm for your taste uh, but what I loved about it when I first pulled the cork was this explosion of just you know beautiful golden apple fruit I'm not wildly esoteric when I talk about wines Teresa mm -hmm. the, the tasting notes you're more poetic than I am but that's Chardonnay to me that primal apple and pear fragrance, you know, followed by waves of other stuff, including notable ripe citrus in this case. And then on the mm -hmm. a little whisper of oak, but it certainly doesn't command your attention. And the finish is almost salty in its minerality. Um, right. <clears throat> we have a lot of vineyards locally that, uh, that really contribute that beautiful acid backbone and that beautiful minerality. Um, to the wine. It's a blend of about 15, 16 different vineyards, depending on the vintage. So you have to think about, oh yeah, now would be a good time to show that Russian River Valley map again. Oh, good idea. And uh, yeah. is, is, is the farming in, uh, question came through about farming, is uh, a lot of the farming uh, from these guys organic? Or um, really some of them, on, uh, yeah. It depends because we work with 36 different vineyards and they all farm differently. You know, the, the, the more iconic historical pioneers of the Russian River Valley are conventional farmers, you know, and they've been doing it for a long time. And then we have other growers that are more organic and, you know, most, most of our growers are certified sustainable, not necessarily organic, but that's more, you know, business practices and farming practices. So, um, so the, the different vineyards that go into the Russian River selection are, for example, um, Bacigalupi that's up at the top. Um, we get Pellegrini, that large chunk of our blend is from Pellegrini, which is right there in the center, uh, in, the, in the Santa Rosa Plain neighborhood. That's the flat neighborhood that I was talking about. It's called the Santa Rosa Plain neighborhood. And well, I'm um, staring at it and I should be able to see it. And for some reason, oh, there's Pellegrini. Yeah, yeah. kind of in the center. Right. And so that's an important vineyard to talk about when we're talking about the Chardonnay. Um, so, all of our Chardonnay grapes for the Russian River selection, or most of our grapes, 
come from the upper neighborhood that's just down below Dry Creek, that neighborhood where you see Rocchioli and Bacigalupi and HKG Estate. That's, that literally runs along the river. You can see the little blue line running through it. That neighborhood there it is. is called- There's the river, correct? Yeah. yeah. Correct. Yeah. And Richie is there as well. Lots of big names. It's called the Middle Reach. It's where the winery is located. You can see the star, the red star that is oh, where Gary Farrell are. Winery I is. I couldn't remember. Thank you. Yes. Mm -hmm. So that's the warmest part of the Russian River Valley. It's the warmest part of our cool climate. So it's nice and sunny here during the day. It's really sunny right now. And so um, those vineyards end up contributing more of the rich, golden, palate filling, succulent, you know, kind of fluffy fruit in, in this wine. Mm -hmm. And then when you move down back to Pellegrini, that's in the neighborhood called the Santa Rosa Plain, and it's flat, so cold air settles, and um, this vineyard contributes really beautiful citrus uh, and minerality to the wine. We get other vineyards in that same um, Santa Rosa Plain area that do the same thing. They contribute that, that minerality. So you have the best of both worlds. You have these mineral-driven wines that, that make more of a, um, a crisp, sometimes on the leaner side of a wine, and then you have these more you know, rich, mouth-filling wines that leave that, that rich California typicity on the palate. You put the two together, the two neighborhoods, and you end up with this gorgeous, this gorgeous Russian River selection. And it's intended to be our expression of the Russian River Valley as a whole, which is, you know, it's a bigger appellation. That's why we talk about the little neighborhoods within it. The oak is, is wonderful because it's just background. It's there, but you're using a combination of, of barrels, correct? I don't even get yes. overt vanilla. I just get this whisper occasionally, uh, vanilla on the palate or on the nose, but it doesn't command your attention in the least. And frankly, the finish is long and lifted and mouthwatering. So hopefully that makes you happy. It does. That makes me very happy to have, you know, Master Sommelier, Madeleine oh, Trifon, wow. describe the wine so positively. So um, I'll be sure not to call you a song, by the way. Oh, no, so, you can call me a song, but I think I think I, I may not respond to it. That's <laughs> um, these are, I, I'm trying to train myself. To, I haven't actually jumped into social media yet. I may be too much of a fossil to do that. But, you know, texting is my idea of social media, right? But, um, or doing this, you know. Right. So the oak, I don't want to forget to, I don't want to oh, dismiss yeah. your question. Um, so the oak is a lot of light toast. So the long, the more years I spend at Gary Farrell, the more I realize that light toast is the perfect, the perfect pairing with the style of wines that we're producing, the vineyards we work with, the climate, you know, that where all the vineyards are located. So light toast is very complementary to the wine style that we produce. We're looking to capture a sense of place, terroir, from each of these individual, beautiful, iconic vineyards. Why would I wanna mask all of that beautiful purity of fruit with toast? So my goal is to use new oak, which adds spice, it adds structure, it helps to really support the wines during their aging. And you know, you get some piney, woody, oaky kind of flavors in the wine from a new light toast barrel, which I think is very complementary to the style of wines that we're trying to produce. Somebody asked if this is similar to the Olivet Lane that they're, uh, they are having, somebody is enjoying a 15 Olivet Lane Chardonnay. Where's Olivet Lane um, located in the scheme of things? So that's the Pellegrini vineyard that I was talking ah. about. The one in the center is a plain, the flat lying area, acid yeah. settled. It's generally, generally a more mineral driven wine, but 2015 was a hot vintage. Mm -hmm. And so that 15 Olivet Lane is gonna be bigger and richer and golden. It has a little bit more of an oak influence on it just because it was a riper Chardonnay. So um, it's quite different from this wine, in fact. Um, this 2017 Chardonnay is um, definitely, it has that richness and that oily quality to it, but it's not nearly as rich and concentrated as the 2015 Olivet Lane. I want to bring this cunning word to everyone's attention, uh, punchins, which are basically double barrels. It's, it's a good word to know because a lot of people yes. are, are playing with them, working with them. And then you'll also hear the French sometimes talk about demi mouise. Those are a little bit larger, 600 liter, right? But the table, uh, the, the, oh yeah, demi mouise. When you see them, at the, when you visit a winery and all of a sudden you're staring at a barrel going, is that bigger or am I hallucinating? Chances are. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I'm, 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 I'm dragging us uh, slowly into Pinot Noir, but what do we need to know about concrete eggs? Do you use those for aging or for fermentation, or how do you use them? 
So we use it for both. Um, I saw a couple qu uh, comments come through about people drinking. Somebody has a 2012 Bacigalupi. That was my first vintage. That one's nice and crisp and, and lean, or it was in 2012. It's aged beautifully because it had this beautiful acidity. And then somebody else is drinking a 2017 Bacigalupi, which is near Rocchioli, the vineyard. So that tea would be really crisp and fresh on the palate as well. Um, so let's see, your, your question to me was what, Madeline? Oh, what was it about the concrete, uh, the concrete egg? Right. right. So as it turns out, we were talking about uh, Pellegrini's Olivet Lane Vineyard. The last couple of years, we've actually been using the concrete egg to ferment and age the, some of the, a small portion of the Pellegrini Olivet Lane Chardonnay, which I pick intentionally at a, a lower bricks, higher acid level to ferment it and age it in the concrete egg. And we make a special bottling under our inspiration series. It has a black label. Um, it's a beautiful mineral driven unoaked wine. So um, those of you who are club members and want to try it, the first one from Olivet Lane will be released from the 2018 vintage. And what does concrete do? You get a little bit of, uh, uh, well, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna say, you tell, you tell us, what, why concrete? So concrete is really old school, very traditional, um, not as traditional as amphorae, uh, which is a whole other subject, but um, concrete is thick, you know, it's, it's thicker, thick slabs of concrete, um, and this tank in particular is shaped in the form of an egg, so the concrete <clears throat> has better insulation than stainless steel. I'm going to compare it to stainless steel because we're not talking about oak, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's thicker, it's a great insulator. You also get some minerality contribution from the concrete itself because ours is unlined. We don't, some people purchase their concrete tanks with an epoxy lining on the inside. Oh. It's easier to clean it, but I thought to myself, why would I bother buying a concrete tank that is lined with epoxy? You know, because part of the enjoyment of the concrete tank is that it's just concrete. So um, there is definitely, I think, you know, the first few years, we definitely, you know, sensed some of the concrete minerality in the wine. But as the years go on and on, I think you get less of that influence. And, you know, it's porous, it's shaped like an egg, it's, it's thick and is a good insulator. But because of the egg shape, you get a really nice continuous stirring of the leaves. And if people and are really interested. Visit in wineries are going to see these more and more. And they're really yeah. beautiful. They're just beautiful. And they come in different... Uh, uh, sizes as well. I think I've had my picture taken next to a couple of <laughs> Yeah, yeah. A lot of wineries happen these days. So we should uh, jump into Pinot Noir land and uh, probably I would bet money uh, that most of the people on have the Russian River Pinot in uh, front of them. And if you like, I can pick up, I can, uh, I can pull up in a moment about Pinot Noir winemaking, but I love putting the horse before the cart. Can we just taste this together for a moment? And um, do you mind if I opine on what I'm perceiving? I would love if you would do that. I'll talk about the winemaking, you opine about what you sense. <laughs> I have to tell everyone out there that when I, I didn't realize this until recently, that when I approach a wine, I approach it, honest to God, with the same open heart that I do meeting a person for the first time. And it's got everything, you know, I, I am not, my mind is not moving. I very intentionally stop thinking. I trust my senses. And I'm going to listen to the wine carefully. And then if I want to define it intellectually, I can do it very quickly, but I choose not to approach it that way. And when I smell, I don't know why I always close my eyes. It kind of shuts everything else out. And don't forget to look at it too, because it isn't an issue of anything other than it's part of the total package. And it may give you teeny little hints of what's to come, but the Russian River Pinot, it's just gorgeous because it's this true ruby red, dark in the center, and the hue stays true to the very rim, I think. So, you know, what does that telegraph? Young, you know, neither good nor bad. And on the nose, it's this, uh, <laughs> I always think of Pinot Noir as carrying a little pocket of spice, but specifically cloves, and I can often smell it. I like cloves, so maybe that's why. I do too. You know, and do you smell cloves and pinot with regularity as well? Absolutely, absolutely. It's, it's high tone, but oddly, it doesn't command your attention. It like melts into this um, red and some dark fruit as well. But this to me is that gorgeous classic, you know, cherry, strawberry with a little bit of black currant um, in there. And I just love the aromatics. And it also is a lot about promise because this is a young pinot. Um, which is gorgeous. I mean, I spent 
a million years in restaurants. So frankly, um, uh, young is good. I like the I like the smell of fruit, but it's that snappy. I know pomegranate too, that tart red fruit. Perf pomegranate's a perfect descriptor. And there it is on the palate. All of a sudden, whoa, the acidity kicks in, which mm -hmm. I will remind all of us is waiting for a little bit of protein or fat to come mm -hmm. or a little acidity in the food uh, too to soften it. We'll talk about um, food a little bit later. And there, there's a little warmth. I mean, this is not, you know, this is, I don't even know what the alcohol is. It doesn't pull my attention, but it's, it belongs to the wine. You know, it's got a little yeah. Alcoholic muscle to it, followed by mouth-watering acidity. It's gorgeous, young Pinot. Thirteen seven is the alcohol. Mm. So, which is you know, when you Water. compare us to other producers from the region, um, yeah. alcohols generally from the Russian River Valley are uh, many of them are above fourteen percent. Right. So when you see a Russian River that's under fourteen percent, it's kind of a, a sort of a yeah. unique Ooh, thing. Yes, uh -huh. so <laughs> especially when it's coming from twenty seventeen, which was a hot season. But we worked oh. really hard to get the grapes in early. That was, that, you'll tell us about the vintage, that was like, that was a shockingly, uh, a shockingly fast harvest, correct? It was, yeah. So the first week of 2017, uh, we started on the eclipse on um, August 21st of 2017. And we couldn't see the eclipse. It was so, speaking of Russian River fog, it was so cloudy and foggy that day, we couldn't see anything. We were here at the winery and we tried to see it, but no. Instead, we sorted some grapes. We picked some grapes from Bonovia that day, I believe. And um, so that first week we picked about six or 7% of our total production for the vintage. Really slow, easy start, cool weather. And then at the end of that week, just before um, the week of August 20, starting August 28th, there was a forecast for a heat wave. It was supposed to be in the mid 90s. And then um, I was driving down to Biendecito, our central coast vineyard, to go see the fruit, to see the vineyard. And Kirk Locka called me, texted me, and said, have you seen, have you seen the forecast? And I said, yes. And he said, it's gonna be 104 here tomorrow, or maybe it was even 104 there that day. So what, as it turned out, the heat wave, was far, heat wave was far worse than it was supposed to be, worse than it was forecasted. And we ended up seeing temperatures, you know, upwards of 113, 115 degrees. So um, we picked that second week, starting that Sunday. I, I talk about Sunday to Sunday. We picked 53% of our grapes that week in seven days. Holy moly. So we had 60% of our grapes in by the end of the second week of harvest. <laughs> <laughs> so it went like this, but we are so grateful that we did it because when I taste these wines, these are some of my, um, pr I'm, I'm more proud of these wines than I have been of many other vintages. I think the only other vintage in my career that I can say I, I'm that proud of is maybe 2010 when I was at Freestone. That was a, you know, heartbreaking vintage. It got really hot. The poor grapes had been drenched in fog. It was super cold all season long. And then it got really hot all of a sudden and they shriveled up and, but we still, we spent hours and hours, you know, painstakingly sorting through the fruit. And I made some and great you, wines. You didn't, you didn't take much of a breath that, that harvest. This was a, a no yeah. time for you, I bet. No, there was no breathing in 2017 or in 2010 to compare it. Anyway, so, um, so yeah, we ended up with a really, you know, wines that are very vibrant and fresh. You can see the color is very vibrant red. And the flavors are really crisp and lively and vibrant. It's not tired. They don't taste like jammy, jammy fruit qualities. You know, it doesn't seem like a wine that was from a hot, hot vintage because we picked everything before, you know, they sat out in the heat for too long. So you picked, again, I watched all the videos, you know, my, my, uh, I just thought, why not? You went to the trouble of making them, but you, you're picking in the early morning, correct? Everything's picked um, late night, early morning. Late night generally night. delivered to us by 6 or 7 a.m. So people are harvesting with like, you know, uh, uh, lamps on their heads, right? Yeah, the dorky it's headlights. Worth going to the, it's worth going uh, to the website and trolling around. If you can't find it, we'll send it to you. But um, I'm amazed at the acidity you got in this wine. And uh, you'll tell us uh, what, the, what the grape sources were, but can you talk a little bit about Pinot Noir winemaking since we've got this up? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I want I don't want to skip. I see questions coming through. By the way, Nancy says that it was 2014 that we had the dinner here at the winery, just I FYI. Know. 
<laughs> thank you, Evan Goldstein. Yeah. Yes, thank you, Evan. Um, yeah, it's supposed to be hot. I see a comment from Amanda. This week is supposed to be really hot. Uh, why do we mo make both Chardonnay and Pinot Noir wines instead of specializing in one or the other? Uh, because we love to have variety. We make uh, six to eight different Chardonnays and 12 to 14 different single vineyard Pinots. And it just makes it so that we can offer a wine for every palate, which is great fun. And Sanye, the, go ahead. What is the percentage of Chardonnay to Pinot Noir production? Forgive me for, for interrupting you. Is it like three quarters? <laughs> We're like... 60, 65, 60 to 70 percent Pinot, and the okay. rest of it is mostly Chardonnay. We make a little bit of Zinfandel and a little bit of Sauvignon Blanc. I'm glad as well. you, make, you make plenty of Chardonnay. Thank you for continuing to do that. We do, yes. So now um, it looks like I, I got to the end of the questions. Oh, Sanye is um, bleed, bleed off. So in a big crop, like I was talking about 2012, 2013 was big. When you want to concentrate the flavors of a red wine, you bleed off some of the juice immediately after the fruit is put into the tank because the color hasn't soaked into the juice yet. Think of it like a water aqueous solution and solids. <clears throat> so if you leave it sitting for longer than 24 hours, your juice is gonna turn really dark and you're gonna, if you drain off juice at that point, you're gonna end up stealing some color from the wine. But if you bleed the juice off right away, it concentrates what's left in the tank. And bleed is why it's called sangue. Uh, sang, sang, Sang it? Yeah, no, you said it perfect. And actually, that, that technique is used to, to make rosés uh, uh, all over the world uh, with some It is. Um, yeah. But, you know, no, I was wondering about the origin of the word sang is blood in French. I can't remember the word, but that's yeah. where it comes from. Sang is blood. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about uh, how you make Pinot, particularly just for my edification, because it's a subject a lot of Psalms talk about whole cluster fermentation. Uh, right, that's important. For me, it's very important. So um, just to give the quick rundown, since you have it here in front of us, um, the Pinot Noir is picked at slightly lower sugars compared to other you know, producers in the area. It's a range, but I like to pick a couple of degrees bricks lower. Bricks is a measure of sugar. Um, and then I hold the fruit in the tank. Um, I cold soak for a few days just to extract all those beautiful aqueous flavors from the liquid in the grapes that I was just talking about a moment ago. That's the other reason why you don't want to do Sanye later because you're losing not only color, but also flavors, esters, aromas. And then we initiate the fermentation, which lasts a few days. Uh, during that time, during the peak of alcoholic fermentation, you've got yeast, you've got grapes, you've got all the beautiful juice and skins in there as well, and stems if you've done whole cluster, which I'll explain in a moment. Um, so during the fermentation, I punch down maybe two to three times a day. Occasionally, we'll do a very gentle juice pump over through a screen just to get it some circulation. If the yeast needs some air, some oxygen, sometimes I'll do an aeration um, where we filter out. We use that screen to filter out the solids so you're not pumping any solids. This guy is punching order. down, right? Yes, this guy is punching down our oak tank. And that one, we don't have an automatic punch down device, so he has to stand up there on the plank and punch it down by foot. We say by hand, but it's really by foot. So um, whole cluster fermentation is very important for me. Not everybody likes it. I think it's, um, it's a love or hate thing with a lot of winemakers. But I already explained how we're making wines that are intended to be an expression of the place. Rocchioli is intended to express not only Pinot Noir, not only the vintage, but also the place. I think that the more of the material that you have in the tank, the more of an expression of place you're going to have. So when we're talking whole cluster, we're literally talking about the whole bunch. You cut off the whole bunch, cluster, stem in the center, everything. So I do um, anywhere from zero up to 50, maybe even sometimes 100% whole cluster, depending on the vintage. Oh. It adds beautiful spice, beautiful um, black tea aromatics and, and flavors. And it Is there structure. any downside to it? Is there any reason you wouldn't use it? Or why, when do you choose not to use it? So I choose not to use it when the stems are green. So generally in warmer climates, the fruit ripens ahead of the stems, and I'm unable to use um, a large percentage of whole clusters from, from warmer climates. Cooler climates, the fruit and the stems ripen together um, in sync, and I can use higher percentages like at Fort Ross or at Hulbert. Cool, and here we are with the neighborhoods, because you've got at least, what, two or three going in into this Russian River, don't you? There are actually about 22 different vineyards that go into the Russian River Selection Pinot. I just saw that question pop up as well. So um, we have all these uh, five different neighborhoods, four of which we, we source fruit from currently. 
Um, and this year we're getting one from Laguna Ridge as well. So each of the neighborhoods make up the quality of the Russian River Selection Pinot. So you've got the middle reach I already talked about. It's the warmer region. There you get um, sort of less tannic, more red fruit, succulent, rich, velvety fruit on the palate with not, a, um, not an aggressive backbone and not as earthy as some of the other neighborhoods. And that's where Mr. Rocchioli's Vineyard's located. Correct. Right. Mm -hmm. And then down on the eastern side there, you have the Santa Rosa Plain. I talked about that when I talked about Pellegrini. It's the low-lying flat area, cold air settles, so you get sunny days with big opulent um, aromas and flavors, really concentrated fruit, and really beautiful acidity and big structure as well. In the center, you have the Laguna Ridge. We don't currently um, source fruit from that neighborhood, so I'm going to pass by it. Green Valley is out to the west. That's where Hallberg's located, and we're going to talk about that wine um, immediately because we're running out of time. But um, that's a very cool climate located in closer proximity to the Pacific Ocean. Very sandy, classic Gold Ridge series soil. Very, very powdery, silty soil. I don't know if you can see this. Oh see yeah, I... absolutely. So good drainage, huh? Yeah, you can see, ooh, the powder's coming out of it. It's like dirty sand. It's like a dirty sand beach. Oh, very so, cool. Very fine, powdery, silty soil. So the, the roots actually penetrate pretty deeply into the soil and they can, they can pick up a little bit of their own moisture. So um, Hallberg, for example, likes to dry farm. And then down in the southern tip of the map, you see Sebastopol Hills, which is a really cool, windy climate. It's very similar to the Petaluma Wind Gap and also similar to Gap's Crown. So you can imagine um, really you know, acid-driven, very bright red fruit flavors. And you think about all that contributing to the blend, and that's why you have, as you were describing it, you were talking about all the neighborhoods. You were talking about red fruit and black currant, and um, so you did a really good summary of including, encapsulating qualities of those different neighborhoods. There's uh, Rocchioli Middle Ranch, and I will, Middle Reach, sorry, and I will tell you, if everyone rubs their tongue against the roof of their mouth, I was telling uh, Teresa before we got on officially, that I love the tannin structure on these pinots because you know it's fine and good to say soft tannins or light tannins or easy tannins, but I pay very close attention to structure. So mouth-watering acidity and when I rub my tongue against the roof of my mouth, the texture has changed. So even though the tannins are soft to the point of all the flavors surging through, you taste young Nebbiolo, the tannin shuts the wine down. You can't taste it, right? right. Without neutralizing them. But still, the tannins are not inconsiderable. They're just gentle. They change the texture of your mouth. I just love the flavor on this and the, the mouth. Thank you. And there is Hallberg, which hopefully Hallberg. is going back and forth between the Russian River and the Hallberg. But boy, you know, even okay. looking at it, it's very different. Very different. It's a different vintage. And also, it's um, this. the 2016 is a perfect representation of what Hallberg has to offer. So when you compare the two, even though they're different vintages, you can see um, the difference in color. I don't have a white background, so you can't really tell, but um, if you look in your glasses, the, the 17 Russian River Selection is more red fruit, and the Hallberg is a little bit more blue and purple, and the flavors follow um, exactly. So the flavors are more cherry, pomegranate, rose petal floral aromas. The Hallberg is classically more blueberry, blackberry, black currant, and maybe violet petals instead of rose petal as the floral aromatic. Oh, I love so. that. Fresh violets and like, it's a, there's such a thing as a black rose. That's what it smells like. You black know? rose, I love that descriptor. <laughs> 2013 Hallberg from Stephen Reese. Excellent, that's one of my favorite Hallbergs ever. I still, I, I think I still have some experimental bottles of our 2013 Hallberg that we did. Um, what did we do? Filtered and unfiltered. So we bottled some up for, you know, to look at later. And I, I drink those as often as I can. Now those, those are slightly grippier tannins and more pronounced acidity. Is that due to the proximity to the Pacific, Teresa? Yes, it is. It's due to the cool climate, the fog, the proximity to the ocean. So it has kind of a, a saline quality to it as well. And definitely it's, it's more earthy. It's a more earthy expression of Pinot Noir because of the climate and because of the soil. Does it remind you of Burgundy at all? You know, actually, that's a good question. I, I hate to compare um, California producers and, and our own wines to Burgundy, but I can make a comparison in terms of the, the regions, right? So Cote de Bone is generally more red fruit driven. 
Cote de Nui is generally darker fruit. So I would say the Russian River is more Cote de Bone and the Hallberg is more Cote de Nui. Oh, I think so too. And also it's, it lurks a little bit more. Should, yeah. Uh, now I should show this and you, you have to look at the bottom. So the Hallberg designation is on the strip label at the bottom. And yep. I'm sorry that my virtual background is a little bit um, Here, oh, I'll hold it up as well. That's a cleaner yeah. version. <laughs> Um, you know, if you have any questions about the Halberg, either, uh, Tino, we are keeping an eye on ah, natural yeast. Good question. Oh, yeah. Uh, somebody asked about natural yeast. Yeah. Um, we do use natural yeast when we can, but we have a small cellar and I need to have a sense of control over the timing of my fermentations, the duration of my fermentations so that I can fit all of the grapes in the winery. And so, um, using commercial yeast strains help, helps me to have a sense of control. So we do mostly use commercial yeast. I use Burgundian yeast isolates because they work really well. I have one that's a very cool, slow fermenter that I can use at the end of harvest or in the very beginning when we don't have a lot of fruit, you know, forecasted. But then when we get really busy, I have this amazing yeast strain that's a little more aggressive fermenter. Um, it's called BRG. It's from Burgundy. Um, it gets warmer. Uh, the yeast, you know, create more heat in the fermentation. And so it's a really great extractor. So it does a really great job of extracting from vineyards that may, maybe I don't usually get enough tannin from them. I think it's wonderful you're being honest about this because it's yeah. kind of a, you know, conventional wisdom has it, made it is better. But, you know, yeah. conventional wisdom is begging to be, you know, nudged if not kicked with regularity. Mm -hmm. And the reality is you're certainly not going to use culture yeast that's going to impact your flavors in a way that doesn't make you happy. And you're using right. it to manage the fruit, correct? Native yeast is very unpredictable. Natural yeast is very unpredictable. I used to do 100% native fermentations at Freestone. That's natural yeast fermentations. And they produce a lot of, nat native yeast produces a lot of um, ethyl acetate in the beginning of the fermentation. That's the smell is like when you're taking off your, your nail polish. Oh, and it's a natural product. It's a, no, it's a natural <laughs> yeah. product. They produce it in the beginning when they're stressed and just getting going, but then it goes away completely uh, mid-fermentation. But it can be a scary thing, and it's unpredictable in terms of how long the fermentation will last. Do I have a sense of control that I at least have a few days to do punch downs and get the, ext the desired extraction that I want? So this is why commercial yeast strains are a beautiful thing. And you're not risking the fruit. I mean, at the end of right. the day, that's, that's, to me, that's the takeaway. Now, you used that beautiful word fluffy when you were talking about the quality of the fruit on um, the Chardonnay, but I'm going to use it to talk about a subject that may seem fluffy, but I think is near and dear to all of our hearts, especially since we're in like, you know, depending on where we are, semi or full lockdown mode, and we're probably uh, cooking more than we used to. One of my best friends, uh, who you probably met, Tim Gazer, we were, uh, he's a master sommelier who's going to come yeah. up with a book on blind tasting, God bless him, which will be mm. a gift to everyone. But um, we were texting ourselves yesterday and he said, I haven't been to a restaurant since um, we were doing uh, an MS advanced course in uh, March, March uh, 10th in. Uh, wow. So, you know, here we are uh, wanting to know what goes with what. And um, if I understand that you work closely with your sommelier, who I haven't met. Can you tell us who that is and if food yes. is an important subject to you? Yes. So um, our estate sommelier is Tiffany Kuhn, and she is actually doing harvest with me this year uh, with us at the winery. And she's doing our vineyard grape sampling um, just to build more knowledge to help her have a better understanding of the vineyards as she's educating people about them. So I consulted her on the pairings. I always consult her on the pairings. And these are three beautiful pairings that she she came up with for the different wines. So the Russian River Selection Chardonnay, um, you can pair it with seafood, you can pair it with a lot of different things, but it would be beautiful with, um, you know, this this buttery scallop dish. So seared scallops with a lemon beurre blanc, or you could do poached halibut with the same lemon beurre blanc. And the cheese, really, go ahead. Brilliant, Boucheron, right? Goat's milk, yeah. which is, yep. tart. and remember what we talked about earlier, when you have a wine that's tart, Tart wine loves goat cheese because oddly, the acidity of the tartness of the goat cheese makes the wine taste softer and smoother. It's the damnedest thing. Yeah, and I had goat's cheese last night with the uh, Pinot Noir that didn't go well with it. Does that make sense? No, it does actually. I think I bet money it kind of flattened it out and dominated. It did, it did. 
Yeah. yeah. We didn't pair it. It just happened that we had this wine and we had this cheese. And so it just wasn't a good match. So what, what is your sommelier's name again? Tiffany Kuhn, K-U-H-N. I have to meet her because I love the Berblanc thing. And again, yeah. you have met her. Have I met, was she at the, um, the event? Not the one at the winery, but there was a, um, you were attending an event that Nancy and Tiffany um, attended as well. And they featured one of our Hallberg wines, like a 2014 Hallberg. Oh, and I remember you telling them. Yes. No, I, I think it was in Chicago. Thank you yeah. for reminding me. Well, give her my warm hello and compliments. I think she may be listening. I'm not sure. But if she, Hi, if not, then I'll, <laughs> if not, then I'll let her know. I apologize that Teresa had to goose my memory, but I love sommeliers. You're my clan, man, you know. <laughs> but I love the Verblanc because you have one foot in the old world where you have this beautiful butter sauce that's got tartness to it because it's got acidity also and the sweetness of the scallops. Also, I will say personally for me, Chardonnay that's got a kiss of oak um, adores uh, saffron and, um, and butter sauces, like brown butter sauce. So I'm adding my, my 10 cents. And then uh, on the two Pinots, now. Yes. Go ahead. Oh, so um, in fact, when you were talking about the Russian River Selection Pinot, the 2017, you were talking about the bright acidity and the bright red fruit, the pomegranate. And you were saying how, um, what did you say exactly that you can have it with? Oh, you can have it with, it's, it was waiting for, it was actually sort of hoping for food that either had a little bit of protein and fat to soften that acidity or food that had a little bit of tartness itself because yes. tartness will make the wine taste a little bit smoother. Yes, right. you said that. And then I was immediately thinking about the pairing that she came up with and a wine dinner that Nancy and I hosted in Miami years ago. But um, most people don't think of pairing Asian cuisine with the red wine. And I think that a Pinot Noir that, uh, at least when I'm talking to people, you may have a different experience, but people don't generally talk about it. And so generally you think of something like we have here, the pork tenderloin, the, the alternative that's listed there. You know, a standard pork tenderloin, maybe a coffee brined pork tenderloin, something like that. But our wine, because of the acid backbone and this fresh, bright fruit, pairs beautifully with Asian cuisine. So this pork belly bao is moderately spicy and citrusy so you're saying you know something with some acidity yeah. to it pairs beautifully um in fact i'm starving right now and i wish i had a, a pork belly bow <laughs> i am belly oh right and now. it's sitting in a perfect little um uh, a perfect little uh bun dumpling right yes oh well, it, yeah it's in yeah, like yeah a there pork. it is i see it right there i was going to say the reason i think people are afraid to or may hesitate to do asian i don't think you have to worry about heat spice with pinos like this you know, yeah. you're going to blast it with heat, but you've got all that fruit, which is an illusion of sweetness that'll cool the heat down. You can chill the wine to the point where it's cellar, 55-ish. Mm -hmm. um, as long as you're not doing five, you know, five alarm chili, I think you can do, do a little bit, bit of spice um, with Pinot and the Russian River will handle it fine. But I think she's got something a little bit deeper planned for that Hallberg, right? Yes, she does. Um, and then anyway, don't want to forget the cowgirl creamery wagon wheel, which is a beautiful oh. cow's milk cheese that just goes really well with Pinot Noir in general. Um, it's not a heavy cheese by any means, but it just goes really well. So then with the Hallberg, um, we already talked about how, and you, Madeline, talked about how um, it's a different wine. It's very different from the Russian River Pinot. It's darker, it's earthier, it has more structure to it. Um, it screams for, for food, rich, richer food. And so duck breast, I think, is one of the quintessential pairings. I think duck breast and salmon are kind of like, and pork are quintessential pairings with Pinot Noir. So seared duck breast with mushroom risotto. Mushrooms are also a quintessential pairing with Pinot Noir because of their earthiness. Um, and, you know, the reality is the Hallberg, to me, will hang next to Cabernet. <laughs> If you chose to go back and forth, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kick that conventional wisdom, by the way, I have this thought that great wine can handle, you know, there's, there's a suggested order of consumption, and generally Pinot is, is consumed on a big dinner before uh, a Bordelais variety, but where right. I'm going with this is when you have a, a, a Pinot Noir like this with so much promise, with some serious dark flavors and a little bit of grippy tannins, even for Pinot, um, you could drink it alongside 
um, a Bordelais wine with the same dish, without right. water, without cleansing your palate, and it would absolutely hang. Do you agree with me or do you think I'm crazy? I agree with you. I'm going to tell you a very quick story. So I was in Lake Tahoe last week and I haven't been dining out through shelter in place through the whole coronavirus thing. You know, right. I'm a little bit of a germaphobe. And so I've just been really careful, but it was our, my wife's and my anniversary. And so she convinced me to go out to this really beautiful restaurant in North Lake Tahoe. They had a really nice wine list. Um, and we had a beautiful bottle of wine, a Pinot Noir with, um, with a Moroccan spiced lamb shank. You know, something that you'd normally yeah. have with a Syrah or possibly yeah. a Cabernet. So, and you know, it was beautiful. And the Halberd would be a beautiful pairing with that. And it worked well, yes. It worked very, very well. And we've been referring to Nancy. Nancy Bailey, by the way, is, uh, has, you know, as you have in Thank my you. heart become a dear friend, you know, through virtual and, um, and emails and a little bit of in-person uh, exchange and she will uh, she will not be happy with us if we don't talk about your sustainability initiative right like, right drink a little more wine everyone and listen up for a moment because this is important yes this is so um yeah 80 85 starting in 2019 we've been working with our growers for a while now um and just you know making sure that everybody's got their their pieces together to be certified sustainable because many of us are and so 85% um, of the grapes in each bottle bearing Sonoma County sustainable, uh, so the seal, um, they must be certified sustainable grapes grown in Sonoma County. And um, we, as of July of 2020, Gary Farrell has bottled 31 wines with sustainability seals. Oh, so that's right incredible. Well. That's incredible, right? To think about that. And so it's a big deal. And we have a sign down at the bottom of the hill that says that, um, that the Gary Farrell Winery is certified sustainable as well. Sonoma County Sustainable Farm Grapes Certified Sustainable Winery. Our associate winemaker, Brent McCoy, went to great lengths to try and you know, get all the documentation together. And he did an amazing job. I give him kudos, kudos. He's our associate winemaker, Brent McCoy. Um, and he, he had to spend a lot of time detailing all of the the stuff that we do here at the winery in order to be certified sustainable. And we but are. You know, that puts a lot of people's minds. We recently at Plum Market, I have to plug this and I don't have one of these signs, my bad. But we came up with a very specific sign with a different color because this is so important to people who want to know if a wine has been made with this kind of integrity, be it sustainable, organic, biodynamic, natural, yeah. however you want to define it. This is very important to people in this day and age. So um, kudos to you for putting this effort into it and people are absolutely paying attention to this. Um, we, we have to address the, the 2020 um, vintage. Can you do that uh, quickly? And what is the temperature out there right now as we see? Oh my God, we don't have the air conditioning on in here right now. Can you see that I'm just flushed red? <laughs> so it's right now, uh, it's gotta be um, mid, mid 90, it's 93, right? Oh no, that's Santa Rosa. Uh, where I am right now, they're calling me Healdsburg. Yeah, it's 93 right now. It's supposed to get up to 96, but I doubt it will at this point. We're at the peak of the, you know, temperature for the day. Will it go down to 60 at night? It usually, it usually goes even lower than that. It's supposed to get down to 57 tonight, which is kind of high. Um, ideally, during the ripening season, we like to see the temperatures get down to about 50 or, or a little bit less than 50 because that really helps the vines to hold on to their acidity. And it slows down the maturation of the grapes overnight. And everybody, that's called a diurnal swing. This is a good party trick, a D-I-U-R-N-A-L. When you hear Psalms talk about diurnal swings, they're talking about the difference between nighttime and daytime temperatures, which if they're big, grapes love. And this is, well, now you are open for tasting so people can go out there, but you're doing it carefully. You're doing it um, with so, social yes. distancing protocol, but we can visit, correct? Yes, you can. And we are doing it more carefully than anybody else. So we're taking it to, you know, the extreme. We've got these great um, hand sanitation stations when you first come in, requiring masks to walk through the salon to get out to the outdoor terrace. Um, and we're only doing tastings outdoors. So... Servers are required to wear their masks all the time. In fact, I see them out there servicing with gloves on too. So. This is so beautiful. I remember being there thanks to Evan. And um, I know we're running slightly over, but we did pretty yeah. okay, you know. I think we did. 
We did okay. And if you take a quick look at the um, at the questions, I want to show everyone something that I don't think you'll mind because I owe you some Michigan wine. I owe you some Michigan wine, and this is one of the guys whose wines I think I'm going to send uh, sell, uh, send you because next week on Thursday we have arguably the most beloved winemaker in Northern Michigan, uh, Brian Ulbrich of Left Foot Charlie. And, um, you know, he is actually going to show three whites uh, and a red, La Frankish, which is doing a good job in, um, in Michigan, AKA Lemberger, it does a pretty good job in Austria and Germany. And this gentleman um, uh, is just, I think the two of you would get along famously because he's very open hearted. He absolutely knows what he's talking about and he's very creative. This wine here, which is winery only, and he's sending it in just for this tasting, is a blend of several white grape varieties. We're also tasting Pinot Blanc and um, off dry Riesling and Blanc well, Frankish. So everyone, if you go to the Plum Market website and you wanna hang with me and Brian, and maybe Teresa will come on board too. I don't know if I send her a couple of bottles. If it's down the road after harvest is over, I would love to. Oh my God, that's right, because you are gonna be working very hard for the next, what? Five Saturday, weeks? Saturday we start picking our first grapes. It's our first wow. day of harvest. And we'll be busy until, you know, end of September, early to mid-October, well, since we're starting early. You have, you have cemented um, existing friendships. You've made new friendships with this tasting. Um, I am going to come out and walk those vineyards with you uh, one of these years, right? <laughs> yes, I hope so. When I can do it, and I promise I won't do it in August or September, maybe January, February. That would be cool. That'd be nice. Yeah, I see another question about bleeding. Um, we only use it when we have to, um, and it's more of a vintage thing. Uh, so in big vintages like 2013, for example, or 2018, um, a lot of the, the clusters are bigger and juicier. And so I would do it on vineyards that have bigger, juicier clusters. Um, I just do it to kind of bring concentration and balance into the, into the fermentation. And somebody uh, asked, what is tannin structure? Which remember I told you I try intentionally to use language that the universe can understand. Yes. Veered into wine speak. So we're just talking about the, the tannin um, giving the wine uh, what, a little bit of a skeleton for the fruit to hang on to? Do you want to describe it in a different way? Um, uh, no, I think you've done a beautiful job. It's just the, um, I mean, tannins literally, um, they bind with salivary proteins in our mouths. And so it causes an astringent feeling, a drying feeling in your mouth. And it's textural, you know, it, it builds the structure of the wine. Without it, the wine's going to taste, you know, too soft. Uh, right. That you want that beautiful tension between that dryness and the sweet fruit. We have someone who is anxious to know what was the name of the restaurant in Tahoe. <laughs> Christy on the Hill. What's it Christy again? On, I think it's called Christie's on the Hill or Christy on the Hill. Christie's on the Hill. I think it's in Tahoe City. And then one final question somebody is asking about uh, whether you change the. Um, the vineyard uh, composition on the Russian River from year to year, uh, depending on the fruit that's coming it's in? It's mostly consistent. You know, the only reason we would change is if we change a, a vineyard source because um, it's not available anymore, or we decide it doesn't work well for the blend. But for the most part, we get a consistent list of, of vineyards that go into the Russian River selection. Well, I have to tell you, um, this was one of the more delightful hours and 10 minutes I will have spent. I give you a big actual hug. I'm Greek. We don't believe in virtual, you know, and um, we should do wish you well. Uh, I can't wait to taste, um, uh, to taste whatever you've got coming out of the winery. I haven't had enough of the single vineyard expression, so that's another reason to trump over and visit. You need to. Mm -hmm. There. And I want to hope that everyone stays um, safe and lighthearted and cheerful. And parents are heroes right now. That's what I want. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and um, some of my favorite vintages, to answer Robin's question, are 2017s are some of my favorites. I also love the 14s. The 15s are bigger and more concentrated. And Fred, I'm not sure which one of the two of us is killing you, but um, I'm envious that you have a 2010 Hallberg. That was a um, that was a special vintage. It's a big concentrated wine. I hope you're enjoying it. So, uh, and uh, every I'm going to wish everyone. I'm going to say to everyone, "Sinyasas or yasas, 
which in Greek means to your health, and it also means hello, goodbye. So it's very much like shalom and ciao, only it's like santé too, because health is the Yes. And uh, Teresa, may health and uh, inspiration in wine and uh, peace of mind uh, and love in your heart follow you wherever you go, because you're such thank a you. maker and you make us proud of American wine. Oh, thank you, Madeline. Um, I adore you and I look forward. We've This is our third or fourth tasting that we've done since, oh, you know, well. shelter in place. So I look forward to doing one, Hope maybe even after harvest. We'll see. Why not? You know, uh, yeah. take care, everyone. I'm going to hang for a few minutes. I'm not going to close it, but uh, we're going to li liberate you to go back to work or to eat something because we've been talking about um, uh, food and I, need to eat. Uh, I think we think you need to, to fix your blood sugar. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Madeline. Thank you everybody for joining. I'm hoping, I'm hoping Madeline can answer any remaining questions. Thank you, Madeline. Nancy, thanks it. for being on. And Nancy is the general manager of Gary Farrell and uh, a notable human in her own right. Absolutely. She kept, Absolutely. She kept this going for all of us. I'm going to take a quick peek at the Q&A after Teresa's left. Um, Russian River Valley wines, something, oh, um, that was a good question. I can email uh, Teresa and ask her, what's something about chemistry you learned in winemaking that you didn't know before? So before I send a recap, I will send that uh, question to her. And um, it was a special evening, wasn't it? I was really excited for you to meet her. We, uh, you know, I don't know if you heard her mention it just now. She was kind enough to just jump on a tasting where I was, uh, uh, I was featuring one of her wines with two others unrelated, and she didn't mind doing that. Um, and then uh, I was lucky enough to be involved in a three vintage tasting of Halberg. So I got to sit there and talk to other sommeliers uh, about minutia differences. And then, so this is our third virtual tasting since uh, the COVID um, crisis. Is there a balance between fruit and acid? That's a good question. And thank you whoever remembers me from my days at Northern Lakes with Michelle De Hayes, who is still a best friend. And I buy wine from her. She works for my favorite, well, one of my favorite small importer distributors, AHD vintners. So fruit, acidity, and tannin all play with each other. Um, the acidity is, you know, the tartness on the side of your tongue. And this is mango season right now. I don't know if uh, you are hip to how good mangoes are right now. You can buy them from Indian shops, but they're also at places like Sam's Club and um, uh, what's the big place that we don't have, John River Costco. And you have this intense sweetness of fruit, but then huevo, this spectacular refreshing acidity. So you have this interplay between actual sweetness or illusion of sweetness from ripe fruit and then that tart, refreshing acidity, and it makes the wine very dangerous because it makes it very <laughs> drinkable. If you didn't have that acidity, the, uh, the ripeness of the fruit could be actually cloying, and that actually happens in warm growing regions. It happens not uncommonly, let's say Napa Valley floor, if you get significant alcohol levels, particularly in wines that Cabernet Sauvignon that can be acid deficient, you can have a very delicious wine, but all of a sudden, you know, the alcohol adds an illusion of sweetness too, and weight. And if you don't have corresponding uh, acidity, the wine doesn't drink refreshing. It can be impressive, it can be delicious, but it's that acid backbone that lifts the wine. Let's see what else the chat room is saying. Uh, just, uh, does she ever need to acidify? That is a great question, and I will ask you that privately also and get back to you. Joanna is our wine buyer in Chicago, God love her. Uh, she makes that set very interesting indeed, and um, uh, she'll be happy to know that even Michigan is paying more attention to South African wines, Joanna. I had Travis ask me if uh, Sadie was available in Michigan. I can't imagine that she needs to acidify, but maybe it's the elephant in the room. I don't I doubt it, but you know, I will ask her. Um, I think that's it. I think we have answered all the questions. And um, I'm glad you didn't mind my interjecting with Teresa, but we had agreed in um, at the outset that we would uh, sort of trip over each other and make sure we covered the subject. 
And I hope you enjoyed this as much as I did. So everyone have a wonderful uh, rest of the day. Uh, I think the humidity was moderate today and the temperature is dropping a little. So I hope you get a nice walk in in your neighborhood. And please come and uh, join us um, with uh, Brian Ulbrich next week. Uh, we'll probably do it more of a chat room style so we can unmute with regularity. And especially those of you from Michigan uh, may want questions uh, or want to simply uh, express how you feel about Left Foot, uh, Old Mission, and Lila and Al. So I'm going to end the tasting. Uh, all the best to you. Sniyasa, Sante, Shalom, Ciao. Take good care.